You and I are classmates. I'm in a role of leadership because to this point, I've learned enough that I don't need to just be sitting there receiving. I've got to at some point turn up and start giving. And, and I'm saying that for this point. There is going to come a time that contenders will stop receiving and you need to start giving. That's what discipleship is. Uh, Matthew chapter 23, verse 9. And do not call anyone on earth father, for you have one father, and he is in heaven. Lord, I thank you. God, I thank you for this moment, this opportunity. Give me now the tongue of the learned to speak and proclaim what it is you've called me to say to your people today. Allow their hearts and their minds to receive this word. Let it go in and permeate our lives. Let it come in and transform our thinking our way of understanding and put us on track with you to do what you called us to do. It is in Jesus name. I simply pray. Amen. Let me, let me start the scripture off by simply saying that, that, uh, your dad is still your dad. So I don't want anybody going, Hey, you ain't my daddy. Don't do that. Uh, that's not, <laughs> that's not what the scripture is saying. Your dad is always going to be your dad and God is always going to be your father. And there's a differentiation. Uh, when, when you look at this text in context, you, you have to pay attention that Jesus is not talking about an earthly father. Uh, he's talking on a spiritual aspect as far as spiritual authority. And this is a very sensitive topic because we in the church have elevated people into levels of spiritual authority. Even uh, myself as a pastor, I'm careful to tell you, no, don't do that. My name is Doug. I'd rather you call me Doug than pastor uh, because... A lot of times we see titles and we elevate titles. I don't get offended. There are people who will get offended, but I don't personally because my name is Doug. It's on my driver's license and they wouldn't allow me to do pastor because it was already taken. Um, <laughs> but when, 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 we, when we read this text, we have to re remind ourselves that Jesus is speaking in, in the context of spiritual authority within the parameters of the church. And, and, and I want to point out this. I want you to pay attention to these words. A man's leadership in his home is pivotal, not only in his home, but also to the state of the local body. A man should be examined for leadership in the church based on his qualifications of how he leads at home. If, if we went by these qualifications, a lot of people wouldn't be in leadership. If we went by and held to the standard of the word, a lot of these bishops, pastors, apostles, and all these other folk that have given themselves titles and paid for them online for $75 would not be in leadership. Ephesians chapter 5. You don't have to turn there, but you do need to write it down and study this for yourself. Ephesians chapter 5 says these words. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as there is a comparison as Christ is the head of the church and he is the savior of the body. So when it comes to the structure of the church, it needs to mirror what God has set in order at home. The Bible states not only in Ephesians 5, but also in Colossians 3, 1 Peter 3, Titus 2, and all of these teach and they identify man as the head this is not cultural. This is not something that happened back in the days. This is the order of God. And, and the only problem I have with us saying and justifying that this is a cultural issue is that we see male headship prior to the fall. I'm going to help you understand some things, and I hope I'm taking my time and making this clear. When we go into the Bible and we see male headship before the fall, this is what we see. The woman was made after the man. That's male headship. The woman was made for the man. Remember the Bible says Adam looked and he saw that everything had to except for him. He was, she was made for the man. Check this one out. She was made from the man. That's male headship. She was brought to the man. That's male headship. Now, I'm not going on some ego trip. I'm not going to come up and say all y'all just ruling because some of y'all don't know what y'all doing. Y'all need to sit down and learn something, but I'm going to get to that in a few minutes. She was also named 
by the man. That's male headship. Before the fall, God established the leadership in the home. This didn't have nothing to do with the church. It was Adam and Eve, and then later Cain and Abel and Seth. This was in a home setting, not a church setting. Male headship uh, because of the sin of one man, the Bible says. Jesus is not referred to as the last Adam and Eve. He's referred to as the last Adam. It signifies male headship. Adam's curse was this in Genesis 3. Because you listened to the leadership of your wife. I'm, I'm, I'm staying in the word. There's nothing to get mad at Doug about. Because you did not exercise leadership. Some of you may be asking, uh, why are you talking about the responsibility in the home when the text references the church? I, I, I'm going to answer that real quick. Um, scripture speaks to the religious leaders. And, 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 and the answer to that question is the role of the leaders in the church will change when men fulfill their roles in the home. Can, can I say this to you and you not get offended? And if you do, it's okay. I hope you learn something. The church is not the source for your spiritual growth. The church is a resource that men should come to, learn, and go back home and teach their families. I, I know what I'm talking about. And I'm looking at the church right now and we just upside down. We're not only upside down in our car notes. We're not only upside down in our house notes. We are upside down in our walk and our standard and our way of living when it comes to the order of God. And it is time that somebody stop tiptoeing around trying to make everybody comfortable and say what God's word says and put the church back in order. For the time that is ours to share, I want to speak on the topic, a structurally stable foundation. If you want to understand a structurally stable foundation, there are three things this text tells us that we must observe. The first thing it tells us tells us that we must look for cracks. When, when you go into a house and, and it's already built, somebody's already lived in, you don't just go in and say, ooh, that's a nice house. You walk around, don't you, Errol? You say, ooh, I like this house. This house has some, some nice qualities. But when you do a walkthrough, you say, oh, but they're going to have to fix that. The, oh, 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 I don't, I don't like the way this is, is set. It's a nice house, but there are always going to need to be some changes. And the problem is when we come into a spiritual parameter or a church parameter, we leave the home and we come into a church parameter and we see things that are flawed in the church. But we, we get comfortable and say, hey, that's just the way it's always been. But according to the standard of God, that's not the way it's supposed to be. And so it is our opportunity, it is our, our obligation to go back into the word of God and say, how God is this supposed to be? We've all got to take a careful look at what we are doing to make sure that what we are doing is what he said. And the problem is, too many of us, me included, take the word of other people without studying for ourselves. Matthew chapter 23, Jesus turned uh, in, in, in verse 1 to the religious scholars. He turned and addressed his disciples uh, along with the crowd that had gathered with him. And he said in verse 2, the religious scholars and Pharisees are competent teachers in God's law. You won't go wrong following their teachings on Moses or the law. But he said, be careful about following them. They talk a good line, but they don't live it. I can go sit down right now. I can go and sit down right now because what we are seeing in the body of Christ is, number one, our leaders are not training a next generation. Our leaders are trying to keep themselves in place so that they can get credit where God is the one that's supposed to get all the credit. 
We, we are in a place where the next generation is not getting an opportunity. So young, strong men like this one that's sitting there looking at me are frustrated and they rather go back to the streets and deal with the streets because the streets will look at their qualifications and say, come on, I got something for you. But the church looks at them and says, you're outcast because you don't fit within the way we dress, the way we act, the way we live. And it's all a lie. Because what they preach, they don't live it. <laughs> to, to put it in your terms, sir, they're not about that life. <sighs> Verse 3, second part, they don't take it into their hearts and live it out in their behavior. That's all spit and polished veneer. Jesus is speaking. He said, instead of giving you God's law as food and drink by which you can banquet on God, they package it and bundle it into a whole bunch of rules, loading you down like pack animals. They seem to take pleasure in watching you stagger under these loads and wouldn't lift a finger to help you. Meaning that they invite you to these churches. I'm going to break it and make, make it real simple. They invite you to these churches and then they preach to you about all of this stuff, but they don't help you understand that God's law was a mirror so that you can look in and say, this is me. I'm supposed to either uh, uh, live according to it or make the adjustments so that my life matches it. But what we're doing in church is, again, we're tiptoeing around and we stay on offering. Or we stay on submitting to leadership. Or we stay on the hot button issues of the day. And we jump on what brings us financial gain. But we don't put you in a place where you can see that righteousness should prevail in every aspect of your life. The way to look for cracks is simply change your perspective. Stop looking over the surface. Stop Stop looking and saying, hey, this is a nice building. This is a nice place. I like it. Uh, you got to actually stand up and walk around. You got to actually come into the church. That's why I'm, I'm happy. I'm grateful. I thought at first I was nervous, Charmelina, about the decision to make people wait about joining this church. But it was the best decision we made. Why? Because people come to a church, they hear a good message, then they join because emotionally they feel connected. But let me caution you, anything you do out of emotions, your emotions are subject to change. And if you came in on a whim, of emotion, I guarantee you, you will leave on the opposite of that emotion. So the best thing to do is to let you come in. You still get the full rights and privileges of a member, but you get to walk around and see what's going on. Is the preacher going to be consistent? Is he going to come in today and preach holiness and come in today the next time and preach the hot topic? Or is it going to be consistent? So you look for cracks. The purpose of changing your perspective is to take another look at something that you've already seen. Some of us need to change our perspective. And, and by changing our perspective, you should recognize where you're in error. And not only should you recognize where the error is, you should find ways to correct the error. I'm, I'm going to be the first to admit it in this room at this moment because I know what I'm about to say. But you soon follow if it fits you. I know what I do wrong. And I also know what I need to do to not do wrong. <sighs> Some people may be asking, Doug, why, why are you so adamant about uh, uh, pointing out all the the flaws of the church. Ain't you supposed to be supporting the church? Ain't you supposed to be a part of the church? Why are you pointing out the flaws? And my answer to this question is very simple. There is no time for us to continue in ignorance of the will of God and be academically affluent in the ways of the world. 
There's no way possible you should come in here week after week, day after day, hear the word of God and still know more about the world than you do the word. If, if you want to come in and be entertained, let me go ahead and help you now. This ain't the place for you. If you want to come in and you want a hot band that's going to play over the latest tracks and, and, and everybody busting uh, uh, praise God over Tupac, then this ain't the place for you. Let me, let me personally escort you to the door and I can point you in the, uh, the direction of about 70,000 churches just right here in Atlanta that don't want to teach you what's going to make you better, but they rather lie to you because you give more when you're lied to. There, I said it. The next phase of your life when you hear the truth should be different because the truth will force you to go and research for yourself. The truth will make you step back and look and say, huh, you mean to tell me I've been doing it this way because Bishop huh, said it to me. <laughs> Pardon my schizophrenic moment. I uh, second thing, th two things I want to give you, three things I want to give you. First thing, you must look for the cracks. Second thing I want you to do, and I'm going to go ahead and put it out there, look for cover-ups. Look for cover-ups. Sometimes when you do a walkthrough, they will disguise what's wrong. Yeah, that's right. Some stuff they're going to leave out because it, it ain't really going to matter. It's small stuff. It's, it's not the big, it's just a crack. You don't know how deep the crack goes, but on the surface, if you keep that, that point of view, it's just the crack. But then it's not just the cracks that you should watch out for. You need to look for what's been covered up. And, and, and with, with training and, and understanding of who you are and who God created you to be, you ought to be able to walk in and see what's been covered up. When you come in this church, my goal is to be as open as possible. Why? Because that's what God told me to be. He didn't tell me to be perfect. He told me to be holy because he's holy. I know I ain't perfect, but I'm working on holy. And as I work on holy, what he does is he comes inside of Doug and he slowly pulls out what Doug doesn't need. And if he can do it for little stinking old Doug, guess what he can do for you? Guess how he can transform your life? He can come in through the water of the word and purge you from the inside out. Watch for cover-ups. Verse 5. Their lives are perpetual fashion shows. Embroidered prayer shawls one day and flowery prayers the next. They love to sit at the head table at church dinners. Sounds like Jesus talking about some of these 2012 through the 2013 pastors. I, I, I say it. I don't have no problem with it. They don't like me no way. It's all good. I love them. Basking in the most prominent positions, preening the radiance of public flattery, receiving Honorary degree. They ain't even working for what they study. Canned sermons. I preach it here and doc, I took it all the way across the country. And nobody was the wiser. God's word is so fresh that I could take this word and preach it 52 different ways. Verse 8 says these words. Don't let people do that to you. Then he describes, put you on a pedestal like that. You all have a single teacher and all of us are classmates. You and I are classmates. I'm in a role of leadership because to this point, I've learned enough that I don't need to just be sitting there receiving I've got to at some point turn up and start giving. And, and I'm saying that for this point. There is going to come a time that contenders will stop receiving 
and you need to start giving. That's what discipleship is. Discipleship is not what church you attend every Sunday, but it's what you're doing with what you learn. My wife's mother said these words, and I, I want to borrow them uh, for, for a moment. She said these words, the simple are so easily amused. In, in other words, uh, those who never step beyond where they're comfortable will become students in classes that will never challenge them to learn more than they already know. When we take a look at the church, I, I want to be real honest, and I'm not dogging the church. I think that once you speak the truth about something, it's either going to uh, 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 it's going to ignite something and it's going to create change or it's going to tick you off and make you go the other way. So I got a 50 50 chance of helping or sending you off because you, your heart wasn't in it in the first place. When I look at the, the place of complacency, we've been in a place of complacency for at least 15 years, realistically. Leaders have become inundated with growing their brands and becoming well-known. I, I have that same challenge. Well, Doug, you got to get out in front of the church. You got to put your face. I hate that. I hate it. Why? Because that's not me. Yeah, I like the spotlight, but I just like to be goofy. There's a difference. When it comes to the word of God, God is the spotlight. I just ain't got no pictures of him. Lastly, people have been trained, check this out, to look for well-noted versus looking for well-prepared. I know a lot of preachers that are preaching that need to sit down because they're not well-prepared. They don't spend time in the Word. How can you spend time in the Word and balance that with training and leading your family when you're traveling the country six months out of the year. You can't. It's not possible. Flights, hotel, extra women. The body of Christ, from the leaders to the lay people, we all need to resign from this way of thinking. Realistically, we need to repent for this way of living and we, re we need to simply return to the truth of God's word. If you came to church for anything other than the word, you are wasting your time. Amen. Coffee was not there this morning. Some of y'all say, I ain't never coming back. They ain't got coffee this morning. <laughs> See, all them people that's laughing is the ones that say it. I just told you the told on yourself. <laughs> Errol. I'll call you out. I'm going to call you out. He said he ain't never coming back no more. He ain't got no cough. <laughs> Jeremiah, write this down. Jeremiah 6. Jeremiah 6, 13 through 15. I'll read it from the Message Bible. It makes it make real good sense. Jeremiah the prophet said these words. Everyone is after the dishonest dollar. Little people and big people alike. Prophets and priests and everyone in between twist words and doctor truth. He says these words and these words hurt like a knife in my back. My people are broken, shattered, yet they put band-aids on them saying it's not so bad and you'll be just fine. But you can't put a band-aid on an amputation. Amen. Do you suppose they're embarrassed over this outrage? No, they have no shame. They don't even know how to blush. There's no hope for them, the prophet is saying, on behalf of God. They've hit bottom, and there is no getting up. Now, watch these next words, because God is speaking through the prophet. As far as I'm concerned, they're finished. Not only should you look for cracks, not only should you look for cover-ups, but lastly, look for consistency. I, I hope I'm making you think today. I, I hope I'm making you think. I, I'll read it from, from the, the NIV and then I'll go into the message. Verse 9. And do not call anyone on earth father, for you have but one father, 
and he is in heaven. Verse 9 from the, the Message Bible says, don't set people up as experts over your life, let, letting them tell you what to do. Save that authority for God. Let him tell you what to do. No one else should carry the title of father. You have only one father and he is in heaven. Don't let people maneuver you into taking charge of them. There's one life leader for you and them. And that's Christ. This is where I'm going to get in trouble today. This is where y'all just send me to the principal's office point. I'll be there. One of the popular things and one of the most popular things that's happening in the church is the error of spiritual fathers. People, uh, please understand this. These are the individuals who are to act as mentors and guides and accountability partners between Christians and Christ. If you're going to be a mentor, great, be a mentor. If you're going to be an accountability partner, great, be an accountability partner. But often in these spiritual father and spiritual sons and daughter relationships, it's often about success, prosperity, fame, and attaining the anointing. Can I, can I pause for a few seconds on this anointing because I really bro, I've been thinking about this whole anointing thing and 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 when I when I look at my life I've done some things because of the anointing but when I look at it from a true perspective TJ I ain't that anointed when when I go back over being in church and and preaching for the last 20 years I I, I gotta humble myself and admit to you I ain't that anointed. 90% of the stuff that I did was based on what somebody told me what anointing looks like. And if I can be honest about me not having the anointing because I realize I ain't never been anointed. All the anointing I know comes through Jesus and that's where my faith goes. If I believe in his anointing, then I could do the impossible. Amen. But we got it twisted. Mm. <laughs> we go to shaking that hand and shaking that head and that's supposed to be the anointing. Who are you fooling? You either got a bad twitch. <laughs> this anointing and all of these other things, the prosperity and things that I mentioned, are supposedly tied to this mentor, a.k.a. spiritual father, whom without him, the believer cannot attain the full blessing of God. So you mean to tell me, you raggedy, you get up and you preach what you can't live. Call yourself anointed. And if I'm not connected to you, God can't bless me. This teaching has become popular due to the trends that Christians today have in pursuit of mostly monetary success and prosperity. This teaching is, is also tied to breaking the curse, the, the breaking the curse teaching in that the believers who have a spiritual father often suffer who don't have a spiritual father often suffer because they refuse to develop a relationship with them. I have preachers and bishops and folk that don't talk to me because I told them flat out, my daddy dead. I don't need no spiritual father. My daddy taught me everything that I needed. I sound like him. I act like him. I, 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 I probably dress like him. I look like I better look like him, but a milkman gonna have an issue. Yeah. So God put everything in my dad to give to me through DNA. And check this out where I lack it. Even before I recognize my lack, God is my father. So when on January 19th, 1986, Ron Gumby took his final breath at 458 p.m. My father was already there. 
He was already taking care of me, orchestrating people who would come in and out of my life to train me in things that I did not know. So you keep your little spiritual father thing. You keep your little manipulative, I want to be your covering. If you, how many critical thinkers do we have in the room? Everybody's not there, so if you're not there, don't feel bad. I'm a critical thinker. When I look at stuff, it's got to make sense. Yesterday, Ed, and, Ed, and, Ed will tell you, I was in the barber shop, and this cat came in, and he started talking. And he was talking a good game, but I've been around the block a couple of times. And my granddaddy taught me, anybody talk that much ain't really saying nothing. And he, he, wouldn't, he wouldn't let nobody get nothing else in, but he kept talking about all his success and, and he's doing a great thing. But then all of a sudden his conversation changed to what I'm doing, to what I'm dreaming of doing. And the dream was bigger than what he was actually doing. So I stopped listening. And if we did that in the church with our spiritual walk, I, I'll say this. I'm human. I'm subject to error. I'm not going to stand here and act like I'm perfect. I'm not going to sit here and promise that I'm going to always say what's right. But you judge my words. Not only do you judge my words, you judge my actions. If I don't treat my wife right, bye, see you, leave. If I don't take care of my family and my home, bye, see you, leave. Because it's a waste of my energy. The sad part is most of these Negroes want to be somebody's spiritual daddy, but they failing at being somebody's earthly father. How is it that the preacher's kids got the worst reputation? Because you're too busy traveling the country, laying hands and prophesying to people. But you ain't spoke in your own home. I said it. I've lived it. I'm going and trying to retroactively make sure that everything is in order in my own home. What profit is a man to gain the whole world and lose his soul? My, my family, my wife, my children are my emotions. I don't know how to handle emotions, but I tell you this, you mess with Aunt one of them, you'll see some emotions. You, you'll forget my occupation, and you'll see, oh, oh Lord, I done left the, uh, what did Jesus say about spiritual fathers? What did Jesus, see, we all want to, we all want to skirt around scripture. We all want to call it a cultural thing, but Jesus, the son of the living God, said this about spiritual fathers. He's talking in the parameters of the church, and do not call anyone on earth father, for you have a father. This is one thing. It took me a long time because I ran to Bishop this and, and Bishop that. And I ran to all of these great men who were doing great things. And, and I saw my life going down a path and I wanted to be like him. Got an S curl tight shirt. I got it all. I just, I went all out. I did it. I tried to be, my wife will attest. I had an orange tight shirt because Eddie Long had a tight shirt. And I didn't know I didn't need to wear that tight shirt till later on. But I tried to be like all of them, everybody that I met. But the more I got to know them and the closer I got to them, I realized that ain't what I wanted. So I went back. I left trying to be spiritually all this. And I just found Doug. And I said, God, what you want to do? And he took that same old little boy. And did some different things with him. Jesus was very clear that we do not call anyone on earth father. We have one heavenly father, our heavenly spiritual father, God creator. He's the creator of heaven and earth. The New Testament uses father in reference to God in heaven. And he is the only one who has authorized blessings and all of the things that you will ever need. But seek ye first the kingdom of God. Bypass these earthly kingdoms. Don't come to, to the contender's kingdom because it ain't one. This is what I know. When it comes to spiritual fathers, I have to compare. 
in the, in the early in Ephesians 5, it says husbands or, or rule, husbands love your wives and take care of your wives and rule over your wives even as Christ loved the church. So when I do this comparison, I have to take this whole spiritual comparison that Christ is talking about and I got to look at it in an earthly form. Two of my children are here. I never will require them to pay me back for what I've done for them. I never will require them and tally up how much they owe me and how much hell they put me through. That's not what fathers do, but this whole spiritual father thing, you know, you got to give. Y'all ain't ready. As a father, as, a, as an earthly father, my responsibility is to provide everything that Jay and Sean and Tiffany need to be equipped to handle life. And my reward and my payment is that they get it and that they live it. If this ain't the outcome, you in the wrong spot. If this ain't the outcome, you calling the wrong folk daddy. Don't call me daddy. If you ain't my child, don't call me daddy. I get really offended. I am not raising nobody else's kids. I got them. I'm good. You got a mama, you got a daddy. God will be your father if you ain't got one. I know I ain't say that right, but I don't say a lot of stuff right. But you understood what I was saying. When my dad died, God was my father. When I was alone in my room and I cried at night for four years in my pillow every night, Missing my dad. He was my father. So it does not matter. It does not matter where you are, what stage you're in. Don't allow what you think you're missing to dictate to you so that you go out and, and replace what you don't need. We're living in a society, ladies and gentlemen, 64% of America's homes are fatherless. And that's a lowball number. 64 percent I'll say 75 and the other 25 probably of the 25 that's left 22 are silent and aren't saying anything fellas all my fellas stand up I'm talking directly to you talking directly to you we have a responsibility we have a responsibility to our homes to our communities to not to, to our own families. There is, there is too much going wrong and we're responsible for it. See, as a man, this is what I've discovered. If I'm in the area of something wrong, it's my job to get it right. I've noticed this. Don't be foolish. Don't go out and do nothing stupid. But I've been in situations where I was in the area where folk doing wrong and I said something and it changed. They might have went somewhere else and did, but they didn't do it where I was. Quit being scared. Be the man God called you to be. Get in this word. Don't just sit here and say, hey, Doug, that was a nice message. No, take this word. Start chewing this word. Let it get inside of you because it ain't just for you. It's your responsibility, fellas, to feed this to your families. Your wife needs it. If more men would begin to proclaim and live out the word, your wife wouldn't come to church and drool over the preacher. <laughs> Women like a man in uniform because he has a job, he has stability, and you sitting at home playing video games. <laughs> Do the comparison. If we got our stuff together, she look at you the same way. If you handle yours and don't make excuses, that's, that's Miss Tay right now. I've been watching Duck Dynasty. Mr. Willie say what Miss Tay want, <laughs> Miss K get. <laughs> and long as Miss K happy, I sacrifice as a man. It hurts every day. But you know what hurts worse? If I was selfish and never sacrifice. If I put myself on the, on the forefront, 
My kids would go without. My wife would go without. It doesn't matter how much money you make. Let me go on and say that. It doesn't. It matters how much effort you put forward. Where your money is short, your effort makes up for it. Ladies are saying amen. It behooves you to listen. With that being said, become the fathers, become the dads that your children need. Become the leaders in the home that your children need. Be that in the home and in your community. You, where you are. They ain't coming to Contenders Church, but you go to the neighborhood, you go to your house every day. They see you. They got respect for you, but you, you don't even know how to handle it yet. Take time to lead. And in order to lead, you got to learn. In order to learn, you ain't learned nothing until you got in the word of God. I challenge you. I'm challenging contenders for a structurally stable foundation. Y'all got to get with me.